this is the Fight Back Podcast, hosted by exercise scientist Georgia Berry. Here, you'll find a series of honest conversations about martial arts and mental health. My guests and I explore the statement that every martial artist has heard. Martial arts saved me. How and why do combat sports save people? Listen to find out. All right, Emma, welcome to the Fight Back podcast. Everyone, I'm here today with Emma Thomas, who is a writer, activist, and she's a former Muay Thai fighter living in Bangkok. Emma, how are you going? Good. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you so much for coming on the show. I'm so excited to hear more about your story and the work you've been doing after reading some of your blog. Um, today, let's start, let's start with a bit of your background. How did you come to be writing a blog about women training in Thailand? Um, so I first started Muay Thai about 10 years ago. Mm-hmm. Um, first of all, I was just kind of backpacking and started training kind of just for fitness in Thailand. And then I decided that I wanted to move here and start training full time and start fighting. But at that time, the, there were some women on the scene, but really not many. And most of the time I found that I was the only woman in the gym or one of very few. So the only way for me to really make meaningful connections with other women in the sport was online. So I decided to start writing about my experience because uh, when I was researching, there really wasn't much out there. So I thought, I'll just put my experience out there and see what comes back to me. And it, it really just started as something small. Uh, I started my website, undertheropes.com. And yeah, the rest is history, I guess. After that, I, I started fighting full time for around five, six, seven years after that. And yeah, still in Thailand now. Do you agree with this statement that I keep talking about on the show, which is people say Muay Thai saved me. Had you had any personal experiences with that or seen anyone else have that lived experience? I hear it so often in the community. Yeah, it definitely resonates with me. What are the type of things that people say? Like, why do you think they say that? Um, I think uh, you've talked about this a lot, but I think uh, Muay Thai and combat sports in general can be a really good tool for healing some kind of trauma and taking control of um, your body or things that otherwise felt out of your control or discovering like a power within yourself that you didn't know you had. Yeah, for sure. Talk to me about the name Under the Ropes. For people who aren't listening, what's the significance of that for women? Okay, so um, if you're fighting in Australia or in other countries, um, you might not be faced with this as much, but in, in Thailand when you fight, um, men have to enter the ring by jumping over the top rope, but women aren't allowed to do that. Um, women have to crawl underneath the bottom rope. In training, generally, it's fine now, but w- uh, when you're fighting, you specifically have to go underneath the bottom rope. And to me, that's very uh, representative of a lot of uh, discrimination uh, that we face in the sport and just the, the different dynamic that we have to navigate as women in Muay Thai. So that's why I chose that as the name. What are some of the other issues or barriers that women have to training in Thailand specifically? I think now it's a bit different to when I first started. Um, Now there are so many more women in the sport and all different kinds. Um, It's not just people who are fighting, people who are coming into it for fitness and for all types of reasons. Um, But it's definitely not an equal playing field at the moment. While we can still celebrate like the changes that have been made, it's still not equal that I still find there are barriers. Um, If you want to fight, you're still not going to get paid the same uh, in many places as the men. Um, And for women also, I think it's just harder to find the right gym. I feel like most men can walk into any gym and feel comfortable, but in my personal experience as a woman, that's not the case. You have to find a place where, first of all, the trainers are going to take you seriously or you, you've got to find that right relationship with your trainer. I think it's a lot more, it's a lot more complicated for women. Yeah, definitely. Sense. Definitely. I only trained in Thailand briefly, but I would say half of the trainers that I trained with and that I only trained with male trainers was super flirty. You know, when mm-hmm. you just like, and it's difficult in a big gym too, because not everybody's going to get attention. And 
you feel like, oh, they're giving me lots of attention and this is good and I'm getting lots of time on pads. And then you're like, oh, and they're saying things that I'm not quite comfortable, but I want time on pads. And I just found that so difficult to navigate, especially a few years ago when I don't think I was as strong as I am now. Do you see that? Yeah, definitely. And especially when you first arrive and you're not familiar with the culture and the language, and there's a lot of things that you can feel uncomfortable with in that um, scenario. I remember when I, in the first gym I was training at in Chiang Mai, when I was like brand new to Thailand, I didn't know anything. And there was this one trainer who was um, very like openly flirty. And like a lot of women, I would just laugh it off. Like I don't know how to respond to it. So I just take it as a joke, you know? And uh, at the end of one training, he grabs me to hug me, which for, for me as an English person is nothing, right? But in, mm. in Thailand, it's very, very different. So because I don't want to, I don't want to say no, right? Because I don't want to make it uncomfortable for anyone. So I'm just like, uh, okay, I go along with it. And I turn around and all the other trainers in the gym are looking at me like, like with this disgusted look on their faces, like, ugh, you know? And I was immediately like, I knew I made a mistake, but I'd been put in this really awkward position, you know? It was really, really uncomfortable. Yeah, absolutely. So like hugging someone means that you guys are together or something like that in Thailand? I mean, Thai people don't really touch each other in that way if they're not close, you know? Wow. And especially in, not in that kind of setting. There was another woman at the same gym who um, she started dating one of the other men who was training with us at the gym. And then all of a sudden, none of the trainers would go on pads with her. <laughs> that yeah. is I mean, we don't get that everywhere, but that was something that we experienced in that gym. It was all of a sudden like she was claimed or something and now no other man in the gym could go with her, you know? It's ridiculous. Wow. Um, but now you've, have you set up women's only classes or you're a part of teaching women's only classes and that's becoming a bigger thing? Um, I, I don't coach, um, but I... I've started um, like a small community of women's classes just a couple of times. So another thing that I do on outside of fighting and writing is um, I'm a committee member of a group called Bangkok Rising. And we're a small group of expat and Thai women in Bangkok who, first of all, we want to just build community for women and get them into activities that they might not usually be open to doing or feel comfortable doing. And then we also pair that with fundraising uh, for causes that are important to us. So um, we've been raising funds for uh, a charity close to us that um, helps women who are survivors of domestic violence. So uh, a couple of times I've done women's only classes um, with Thai female teachers and used the, the funds raised in that class to go to that charity which has been really really awesome that is so great so are you giving scholarships to people to go and join a gym that's close to them or are they going into like a trauma sensitive environment what does that look like so um at the moment any kind of like uh, the concept of uh trauma informed or trauma sensitive like training in general is it just doesn't exist in thailand in, in fact I, I think it's probably similar in, in in a lot of countries. Um, I think before I heard of your work, I hadn't even heard of, heard of this concept related to, to Muay Thai or kickboxing at all. Um, so what I've started doing is just, um, the, the most recent one I did was uh, I collaborate with, collaborated with a local support group for Thai women who are survivors of domestic and sexual violence. And we decided to put on a Muay Thai class for them uh, with a female trainer. And it was really important for me to not frame it as a self-defense class or, you know, because you see a lot of those self-defense, like rape prevention, kickboxing classes. And for me, that's just so far from anything that I want to do. So for me, the, the message of this class was just to, give people the, the freedom to step into a sport that they might not have felt confident enough to do, to build confidence and to build community. Um, and yeah, just to take control back. Yeah. I love this conversation topic around, you know, for uh, violence prevention, 
which mm-hmm. is how Kathy from Shape Your Life would frame it, a violence prevention program. Is the violence prevention aspect of that the fact that it is self-defense or is it the fact that you're embodying these kind of movements that you wouldn't normally do? You get to express yourself in a different way. And, you know, I, I agree with you wholeheartedly. I think it's victim blaming to say... Yes you know, you should have known how to defend yourself. Here's the instructions for how to do that. Because the reality is, is that in most rape situations, the guy's bigger than you. He's stronger than you. You know that fighting back isn't, it's not an option. Even if I was attacked, I would probably freeze because my nervous system would do that automatically, right? So it's very difficult to say to people, you know, you should have done this. I just, yeah, it's hurtful to say to people, you know, these are the things and that just leads to people blaming themselves for something that is absolutely not their fault, right? An adult man made an adult decision to do something terrible to you. It is in, in no way your fault. But I think it's, it's so interesting. And the research that I'm reading, there is evidence for both sides. There is evidence that when women learn self-defense, and then they have a belief in their head that they can defend themselves, then that changes the way they take up space. It changes the way that they hold themselves and that makes them less likely to be victimized or it makes them less likely to be re-victimized as well in some of the literature. But I don't think we have a clear answer on what is best or maybe if it is or isn't a best. So I'm looking forward to finding out more, but I love that you frame it in that way. I think it's really, really, really important. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I think the main thing for me, um, the, the main benefit I found even before I started fighting um, was just the, the difference in my confidence and the way that I would hold myself and yeah, take up space. And I found the same when I started um, powerlifting as well, but I just, the way I carried myself totally changed. And yeah, I'm not sure if, if I can directly say that that would make me less likely to be a victim, but um, I think there's more, there's more significance there in se- than saying like, you can fight off an attacker because you took, you took a self-defense class. Like it's just not realistic. Yeah, absolutely. And it's putting the onus on women to protect themselves, which is, it's just not effective and it's not ethical. No, definitely. I think, you know, to an extent, unfortunately we do live in a world where you could almost say women have to play defense right? Mm -hmm. You make decisions. If you live in a dangerous neighborhood, you're not going to go out at night by yourself. And again, you shouldn't have to do that, but it would be irresponsible not to do that. It would be hazardous to you not to do that. Whether or not one self-defense class is going to make that much of a difference. Really anyone who's trained in in any combat sports will know that learning a technique once, the likelihood Mm -hmm. that you're going to pull off that technique in a fight is so low. Yeah. Yeah, I'm not going into a fight throwing like crazy spinning hook kicks. And and I did karate for 10 years before I did Muay Thai. So I've practiced them a lot of times. You just don't go and try things you've seen once or twice or practice once or twice in real life. It's crazy. Yeah. And let alone when you're in that, um, a traumatic situation, you know, and I think a lot of people don't have the understanding of how trauma affects the brain and how freezing is not just an appropriate response. I think it's the most common response, no matter what your background is. Like I, I get the response a lot from people just saying, oh, well, you can just punch someone or, you know, I wouldn't want to meet you in a dark alley or, you know, you'll be fine. I mean, you can just kick them. And it's like, well, actually, no, like, I still don't think that if somebody attacked me on the street that I could defend myself. I couldn't say that with confidence. No, I think I could confidently say that, mm, no, nothing I could say with confidence. I would run. Whenever any of my students or anyone asks, you know, what would be the technique you would use? I'd use my legs and I would run if I could, if I had the mm. opportunity to run and I would use my voice and I would yell. Um, yeah. And I think that's one of the cool things that they'll teach in children's karate. They learn to ki, which is a spirit shout, and they teach kids, you know, ki is important also because it tells someone where you are in the situation where someone can come for help. And that might even be the thing, if you remember that, that's much more likely to save you than remembering some way to break a grip and then punch someone and kick them in the balls or whatever your self-defense thing that you've learned is. Yeah, I think... um teaching and it's not to say that there's not benefits in in learning self-defense but I just don't think that it's an effective way to to combat rape culture and I just think it's the wrong way to to be looking at it in the same way that when we use these um products uh 
like rape prevention products. Uh, a friend of mine, uh, she's the founder of Thai Consent, and she did some research on all the products that we use to prevent sexual assault, um, like chastity belts and rape whistles and all those kinds of products. And she, she said the main thing that she found in researching all of them is that we are protecting women like their property on all of these cases, like you're protecting them like they're your car or your house, which is very interesting. And at the same time, again, we're putting the onus on women to protect themselves. And it's not that there's not, it's not that we, we shouldn't be encouraged to protect ourselves, but it's just not the correct way of looking at it. Yeah, I just had a thought. I almost wonder if more men getting into martial arts because there's so much respect inherent in that, right? Mm -hmm. Muay Thai is so traditional. There is so much in the Y crew, in working with people, in the level of respect you have to have to spar with each other and protect each other in that way. Just, I do still believe wholeheartedly that it it's going to turn some people into more respectful people and you know, some part of that is just that only respectful people are going to stay. But I think, you know, not just getting more women into Muay Thai, but get more men into good combat sports where they can start to, you know, learn different things. And all the better if some of the women in that class or there are women in that class. And so they get to form these kind of relationships with women and hopefully then, I don't know, maybe that changes some kind of perception. I just had that thought then. I was like, oh, yeah, that's interesting. Thing. Yeah, yeah, there's a, bit, there's a lot to be said for um, what you learn outside of the actual training in terms of discipline and respect in the sport. Yeah, absolutely. And that's really strong in Thailand, right? For sure, yeah. So what's the training like over there for anyone who hasn't seen, what is it like to do a Muay Thai class in Thailand? It's, it's hard for me to say, really, because it's all I know. Like, I didn't train in the UK before I came here, so... I, I don't really know what um, a Muay Thai class is like outside of Thailand. But for me, it's like my, when I was fighting, my usual routine was get up in the morning, go for a run, pad work, sparring, bag work, um, probably not clinching in the morning and then some strength and conditioning. And then I would go and eat and take a nap. <laughs> and then in the afternoon, it would be the same, but more intense with some more sparring and clinching. So that was my daily routine for around five years. Which is heaps. It's hours of training per day. Yeah. And I think, yeah, you probably haven't seen it, but for example, I trained in Australia before I went to Thailand. And even just doing the warm up, um, I think I was they were skipping. And I was like, okay, yeah, skipping's gonna be like five minutes, usually is. And I was looking so like at the, 20 minutes. Yeah, I was <laughs> looking at the clock and every five minutes that we go past, I couldn't believe it. I was like, how are we still skipping? <laughs> I'm not a fan of jumping rope at all. Yeah. <laughs> That's just like one example of how everything just just went for longer. Some of the classes go for a couple of hours, two and a half yeah. hours, which is just much longer than you're ever going to have in a Western country, I think, because most people are training around work and things like that, you know, or okay. they're going to eight hour, eight hour jobs in between. That's what it seems like to me. Or like, you know, every hour, classes will go for an hour and you got your warm up and cool down built into that hour. So it's just so much less volume. You go to Thailand, you're just like, whoa. And they do a yeah, lot two of hours is standard. Yeah. Yeah. And lot like, you know, class will be over and they'll be like, all right, everyone, hundred sit ups and you know, some Muay Thai gyms do that for yeah you know, fight team and stuff like that. But it's just anyone who's coming to the business is doing that which is fantastic for your grit right if we talk about um, definitely you know personal qualities that you can improve upon by doing a combat sport by doing something like muay thai learning not to give up when things suck is definitely yep. something you're gonna get absolutely yeah there were a lot of days that i cried and just had to push through yeah <laughs> Yeah, we've all cried on the mat off, yeah. the, <laughs> off the mat at some point. It just keep kind of going forward. Yeah, that's it. You mentioned in one of your blog posts when you're talking about We Are Fighters, which mm -hmm. that's the charity we were talking about just before, or is that the program that, that you guys ran? That was uh, the name of the class that we ran um, with the, the support group. Yeah, that was the first of its kind that we did. Um, so this group um, is set up by my friend Jom Tian, and she is a, a victim of sexual violence herself and an activist. And I met her when we were both speakers at an event by UN Women, a gender equality event, 
where we were both talking about um, personal experiences of sexual violence. And we just clicked and we've been working together ever since. And she set up the very first Thai language uh, support group um, for victims of gender-based violence. Um, and she'd been doing uh, some other activities with them, like art therapy and stuff like that. And she'd heard me talk so much about how Muay Thai has empowered me. And she really wanted to extend those benefits to the members of her group. So we decided to collaborate and put on a class and it went really, really well. Is it plan to do more? Definitely. Yeah. That's amazing. So your experience, was it before or after you started Muay Thai? Um, my experience of sexual violence. Mm -hmm. um, the one that I am been, have been most vocal about, it was before I started fighting, but it was when I first started Muay Thai, it actually took place in a gym in Chiang Mai in 2011. And how did you feel coming back to, did you come back to that gym or did you go to a different I did. Gym? Wow. Yeah, it was a, it was a hard decision to make because I was backpacking at that point and I'd already committed to uh, at least a month in that gym. And I think especially when you first come to Thailand, um, you kind of fall in love with the gym and you'd feel like you're not going to get that experience anywhere else. And um, like I said, as a woman, it's hard to find a, a gym that you connect with sometimes. Um, but I had this experience with a trainer there, actually. Um, I've written about it a lot on my website. Uh, but to, to sum it up, I'd, I'd gone out on, an, on a night out with some guys from the gym, including one of the Thai trainers. And at the end of that night, everybody told me to go home with this guy. He'll, he'll bring you back because we were all staying at the gym. They said, oh, he'll give you a ride home. He'll look after you. Um, but he didn't take me back to my room. In the end, he took me back to the gym where he attempted to rape me. And I, the next morning I went back to my room and I, I, I think I locked myself in my room for about a week and I thought, am I going to stay here or not? It kind of took me a while to process mm -hmm. that what had happened was actually, was what it was, you know? Um, and in the end, I decided that I wasn't going to let this guy take away what I came here to do. Um, so I decided to stay in the gym. He was actually fired immediately um, because I, I went to the manager and told him and they, they got rid of that guy immediately, which is good. That won't happen in a lot of gyms in Thailand, I can tell you. Because um, after, after speaking out about this, I connected with a lot of other women who'd had similar experiences. And they said, some of them had said when they'd gone to management that they were just brushed off or not believed. So um, I suppose it was good that they did get rid of this guy. And I decided that, um, yeah, I didn't want to let this experience stop me um, from doing what I came here to do. So I decided to stay at the gym for another month, um, which in hindsight wasn't the best decision only because the other people that were around me in the gym, the other men I were training with were not sympathetic at all <laughs> and they were uh not only were they like making fun of me or you know some of them were also like harassing me themselves after that so it was a really toxic environment and eventually I left but when I came back to Thailand I ended up uh training and living in Bangkok so I never went back to that gym after that. Did you develop any PTSD like let's call them symptoms or you know adaptations? I'm not sure. I mean, what symptoms would you say I'd be so, looking for? You know, not able to sleep, feeling anxious, having unwanted flashbacks coming in where, you know, you're imagining reliving it, panic attacks, um, spacing out, dissociating, anything like that. Um, I think in the immediate aftermath, no. I mean, I just kind of tried to not think about it, you know, especially as I'd been traveling by myself. I didn't want to tell anyone what had happened. I certainly didn't want to tell my parents or anyone at home because I didn't want them to worry about me or to, you know, have their worst fears confirmed. You know, this is why we told you not to go traveling by yourself kind of thing. Um, and it wasn't until years later, maybe five or six years that I started to talk about it with other people. Um, and I, was I had a partner at the time and I 
uh, was talking it through with him. And that's when I decided to write about it and speak publicly um, to other women in the Muay Thai community. Um, and I did find that at that stage, when I started finally processing it years later, that I did start disassociating and yeah, intimacy became a problem for me for a while. Um, yeah. And I, sometimes I do, I do, I do still have flashbacks as well, but I feel like for me, because I've done a lot of not only writing, but public speaking on this topic several times, I feel like that has actually been a really good way for me to process it and to take my power back. And that's been really healing for me. Yeah. I, I ask because I wonder what the impact of even just getting straight back into training was like, it's a, it's a different kind of dynamic where you're in training, but you're still feeling fearful and it's a toxic environment, but from a somatic experiencing perspective, for example, like that, branch of psychology would say that you know you gave your body a job you gave all the the inability to fight back the ability to at least act that out from a physiological level right your muscles made those actions of punching and kicking back really soon after the event and I wonder like what impact that that would have had it's hard to say because of course it's married with you know, holding something in and not talking about it and yeah. kind of like pushing it down from an emotional, mental side of things, but from a physical side of things, then that's managing it, we would say, well, I suppose, in a different way. So I was interested to wonder if that would still lead to dissociations, which are super, super common as a, yeah. you know, in response and, and all other sort of symptoms of PTSD. I think it's it's, it is critical the way that your body responds to a traumatic event, right? Not every traumatic event is going to lead to PTSD, is going to lead to anything, but it's very difficult or not difficult. It's just very likely that it's going to, especially the nature of something like sexual trauma where, you know, there's, there is victim blaming involved and there's so much that you put on yourself and there's so much shame and there's all these terrible things that really hold it in and that's where it can really start to chip away at you. Yeah, I mean, it's hard for me to say because I, I don't know what it's like to go, go through this experience without having training as an outlet. Um, but especially because when it happened, yeah, I, I froze. I couldn't fight back at all. I couldn't move. I don't think I could speak. So for me, being able to uh, take control of my body and punch and kick after that, it was definitely a way of, of, of processing and healing for me. Yeah, definitely. And this is one thing that I'd say to people is like, if for those who are advocating for self-defense as a way of preventing rape, it's like if someone who is already trained in a martial art cannot fight back in that moment, how do you expect anybody else to do that? Like, how is that a reasonable expectation of the average victim or survivor? Yeah, we've seen UFC fighters be victims of sexual assault. So yeah. I don't, I don't think you can get any more high level in your ability to do self-defense than that. Right. What's next? What's the plan with the, all the activism that you're doing and your work as a writer? What are your future plans? It's hard to say with COVID True. <laughs> at the moment. Um, but yes, I definitely want to keep going with um, the classes uh, with the support group that I've been doing and hopefully grow that. And I also want to do a similar class, um, but more uh, geared towards um, the LGBT community. Um, because I, I have a lot of friends who tell me that they'd really like to get into Muay Thai, but they don't feel comfortable or welcome in that space um, because of their gender identity. Um, so, I, I'm at the moment working with a very famous Thai transgender fighter to teach a class for us. So hopefully that's the next thing in the works for me, because I think that'd be really, really cool. That's awesome. I love that. Are you thinking about doing something with powerlifting as well? Yes. Um, so with Bangkok Rising, I also put on a women's, uh, a couple of women's powerlifting workshops, um, but they were mostly for uh, or like women who'd never even touched a barbell before. Um, because for me, even, even as someone who'd had 30 fights, but walking into a 
strength and conditioning gym, I did not know what I was doing. I couldn't really do push-ups or pull-ups properly. I did not know what to do with a barbell. And I felt really um, self-conscious. So I wanted to create a really open and welcoming space for women who want to do that. Because I had so many women who look at my Instagram or look at what I'm doing and say, wow, I'd love to do that, but I don't know if I could. So yeah, we've been using these workshops to create more welcoming spaces for women. So I, I definitely want to do more of that too for powerlifting. Yeah, it's really important work. I think we're starting to see now from the Justice Research Institute, for example, have got a like a wing, a department that's doing trauma-informed weightlifting. Oh, and cool. there's some research, there's some research papers that have been published now uh, looking at the use of weightlifting as an intervention for PTSD, not just as an adjunctive therapy, but as a standalone therapy and as an effective way to improve sleep, reduce alcohol. Um, I can't remember what some of the other, I'll put the link to those articles in the yeah, show notes I if, anyone wants to, if anyone wants to check them out. But it's a really cool space because like you said, when you do powerlifting, that also changes the way that you hold yourself. Definitely. Um, and there's so many little internal battles you have, right? Where you don't want to do another rep or if you're doing one RMs, it's like, am I going to be able to lift it? Am I not going to be able to lift it? And yeah. that when you flip that switch into like it goes up or even when you don't and, you know, you tried and it got halfway up or there's so many really, really cool internal battles that you start to have little wins with, with powerlifting that I think, definitely, you know, similar to martial arts where, you do get to a point, you know, you've had 30 fights, you know, you are really just fighting yourself. It's your brain that tells you to quit. It's just a kind of a moving target that's doing some other stuff to you, but you're not fighting them. You're fighting you. But powerlifting, I think is, is an, another really great way for that to be accessible to more people, depending on what sort of catches their attention, right? What they think sounds good. Yeah. I mean, I, I stumbled into powerlifting after I'd stopped fighting um, and I was looking for something different, still training Muay Thai, but I, I needed that. You know, it's not the same when you don't have a fight, you know? Um, and I think a lot of uh, fighters can relate to when, when you stop competing, that you feel like a part of you is missing and you kind of need a sense of purpose again. So for me, I, I wandered into a strength and conditioning gym and I didn't know what powerlifting was. They just had a Saturday powerlifting class and my coach encouraged me to take it. And then within a few months, he was like, hey, there's a competition coming up and I want you to do it. Um, and it kind of all happened by accident. And I just fell in love with it. I, I found it so empowering. And people around me were commenting on how different um, I was holding myself and how I was so much more confident. Um, even after, as someone who'd already had 30 fights, which is pretty incredible, I think. Yeah, absolutely. It's transformative for sure. Yeah. So I, I really am passionate about having bringing other women into that experience i love it for this is going to kind of be redundant advice given <laughs> the state of the world at the moment but you're the best person i think to give a brief synopsis on if you're a woman and you want to go to thailand right that's becoming a more common thing as the ufc gets bigger i think there's a lot of muay thai gyms and people train here and they have this goal i want to go and train in thailand what would be your advice for women wanting to do that um, are we talking short term, long term? Short term, going over for a training okay. holiday. Yeah. I mean, I get so many messages from women like, which gym should I train at? And it's really hard for me to, to give a specific answer because first of all, everybody's looking for something different. Do you want to be in the city, by the beach and the mountains? Are you looking to train to fight? Are you just looking for fitness? There's, and there's so many different kinds of gyms out there. But I think one of the best things I can say for women is do your research and a really good resource I can direct you to is um, the Muay Thai Roundtable Forum, which is okay. a, it has a, a women's only forum there where we uh, just exchange ideas and thoughts on different topics. And a lot of that is women advice, sharing their experiences on different gyms in Thailand and asking for advice. Um, and because one gym, one year can be totally different when you, when you come back the next year, it can be full of different trainers, different people, the experience can be totally different. So it's really nice that people come back and, and provide updates there. So I think that's a really good place to look 
um, before you go to Thailand and start making decisions about where you want to be. What about cultural flags? Like the hugging thing that you didn't realize, are there any other things you're like, oh, I wish someone had told me that before I went? <laughs> I mean, looking back, I was, I think it's something I really should have known or I think it was just in the moment that I felt so uncomfortable that my, and this is what I always do is that I wanted to placate him. Like I didn't want him to lose face. I would rather sacrifice my own <laughs> um, feelings for this guy, which I've, I've done in many situations of, you know, street harassment and the rest, like I think a lot of other women have. Um, but yeah, definitely do your research on Thai culture before you come here, like, um, because it is very different. And there are going to be a lot of things that um, you have to adapt to when you come here. I mean, Thai people are very open and friendly and um, welcoming. So you don't have to feel like worried about making mistakes. They're very forgiving in that way. But at the same time, you want to be respectful. So definitely do your research. Do you have a couple of examples of things? They probably seem so normal to you now, but a couple of examples yeah. of, of things that are different. Um. Okay, little no-nos that like I've seen people do. Um, mm -hmm. So in, in Thailand, it's especially if someone is older than you or, I mean, in, for Thai culture, one of the main things is social hierarchy. So in terms of the language as well, before you speak to someone, how you, you have to consider how you address them and that's how close are they to you? How old are they? What is their position in the social hierarchy? Um, and these are all things that are just natural to Thai people, but they kind of seem strange to us at first. Um, even the way, the way you would greet someone is different, um, depending on all of these factors. Um, so and one absolute no-no is if someone is above you in that social hierarchy, you would absolutely never touch the head. Um, there was one guy in my gym years ago who noticed that our trainer got a haircut and went to touch his hair like, oh, you got a haircut. And he slapped his hand away like it was so disrespectful to him, you know, but for, for maybe for foreigners, like it's nothing. You wouldn't think about that. But in, in Thailand, it's very disrespectful. Yeah. Wow. What is the, I can remember, I can't remember properly now, but at the end of class, there's like a different way. Like there'll be like the man say this and the women say this at the end of class. Oh, I'm going to forget. I'm going to butcher this now. You but mean like, like ka? Yeah. 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 For, for women, you would say ka, yeah. Yeah. And they would always be like, and men say, was it cup and cup? And women yeah. say cup? Yeah. Yeah, I told you I was going to be. Yeah, that's it. A while <laughs> <laughs> it's, been, it's been a while now. So I was like, okay, I've got to remember a different thing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, it's a lot to adjust to when you first come to Thailand. Um, and I've been here, it's going to be 10 years in March, what I, which I, I'm still struggling to wrap my head around. Um, <laughs> so, you know, there are still things, um, that I have to adapt to sometimes. So, but like I said, Thai people are very welcoming and forgiving. So yeah, you don't have to worry too much. Yeah, absolutely. And I think too, like we sort of touched on, don't let that put you off if there was oh, no yeah, pandemic, definitely. I think for a personal growth, for a developing grit, for lots of reasons, it's really, really cool to go over to Thailand and train and even just for like how hard you'll push yourself in sessions. Whereas I don't know if other people have experienced this, but when, if you're overseas and you're training, you just kind of go to another level of, cause you're yeah. not sure what, what everyone else is going to be doing around you and what's expected of you. And like, what happens if you quit, you don't quite know if like, what's the punishment going to be for that. Yeah. So you go extra hard and you've realized things about yourself that you just weren't quite sure of kind of like, you know, the difference between training and training to fight. Yeah. You're pushing yourself to another level. Um, and yeah, you've also got to adapt to that heat, which can take a little while when you first get here. That's another bit of advice that I would give to people is, oh my God, make sure you stay hydrated. I had dehydration sickness so many times in Thailand, which is something I never even knew existed before I came to Thailand. Um, cause you sweat so much. You really have to take care of yourself. So drink of hydration, sugar, water, sugar, water, with electrolytes salt. and just drinking a lot. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, I mean, no matter how, how used, used to training in heat or in a sauna suit you think you are, coming to Thailand and training in the 3 p.m. heat outside, you're not ready for it. You're just not. 
yeah, it is something else. I kind of like the way, I don't know if you probably, again, can't remember what it feels like, how it feels differently, but I like breathing the warm air compared to breathing like cold air conditioned air it feels kind of harsh yes. in the lungs. And in some I ways, I don't like training inside. Air is nice. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm so spoiled as well because I can't imagine going back home and training. First of all, kicking cold pads is mm. the worst. I hate mm. that. Um, skipping when you when when your feet are cold it's when you worst. catch your foot That's on the road terrible. it's terrible <laughs> i hate it uh you know going for a run and only sweating in like parts of your body <laughs> you know it's alien to me because i'm used to being just drenched in sweat yeah. um yeah and yeah breathing in that cold air like it hurts my lungs when i go back home i have to really adjust to it yeah well that's why we we're supposed to breathe through our nose more than we breathe through mm. our mouths because the nose hairs heat the air and our lungs mm-hmm. prefer that. So it just makes perfect sense physiologically. <laughs> so a lot of women listen to this podcast. Em, if there was anything you could say on a platform talking to a lot of women, what would you say? Oh, my goodness. That's very general. general. <laughs> um. I'm sure a lot of the women who listen to this are already in martial arts to some extent, but I just think um, if you're looking to take up anything new, whether it's a new sport, martial arts, weightlifting, or even a new, just to walk into a new space that you haven't been into before, just do it because I wish that I found these things years before I had you know and for me as a woman I found that I didn't have the confidence or you know the security to walk into that space and kind of hold my own there was always something that was holding me back that I think that a lot of men don't have to deal with as much so my advice would just be to walk in and do it and it's going to be it's it can be life-changing I love it Amazing advice to my very general question. It's not very helpful (laughs) as a host. (laughs) Uh, If people want to follow up on that or anything else that we've spoken about, how can they get in touch with you? Um, So you can read my work at undertheropes.com or you can find me on Facebook and Instagram at undertheropes and also on Twitter, but I'm not as active there. (laughs) Amazing. We'll put the links to all of those Awesome. Um, as well as to the forum where people can go to for finding yes. um, information about training in Thailand. And we'll put up some of the information about We Are Fighters and some of the groups that you're doing advocacy work for too if people want to get involved and, and donate. I guess it's a way to donate online. Yes, uh, yes, definitely. <laughs> yeah, <cool. laughs> we'll put all those details in there and people can connect with you. But thank you so much for coming on the show. This has been really, really good. I feel like I've learned a lot. Awesome. No, thank you very much. Have you thought of something to be grateful for today? What was it? I'm grateful for the amazing women that train with me at the Fight Back Project. I'm grateful for Nari and the beautiful song Shape Me, which is heard at the beginning and end of every episode. And I'm grateful for you for listening to this show and helping martial arts keep saving lives. So thank you from the bottom of my heart. If you'd like to like and subscribe, oh, that's a bonus. Nobody shapes me but me. Don't gotta tell you what my name is, I don't gotta explain it. Walk in the room, hear a boom erupting like I'm famous. I'm here shedding shells, I'm shameless. Half in nothing, no complacence. Walk to many tight ropes with no hope, so I became this poster. They hold over all the heads of trauma holders. You don't need to know my history. I move boulders. Atlas shrug, cause I lifted the weight above his shoulders. No pretense of defense. Move first like chess soldiers. This goes deeper than empowerment, cause huh, I'm the one that power it. Physical meets mental challenge me to keep devouring. If I can't change the scenery, at least I change perspectives. No longer isolated, but elevated and selective. Darkest places become beautiful spaces. This is where rage meets patience. Meets power meets gracious. 
meets We're so glad you came and the feeling is contagious When you the walking impact of intended bad intentions When you the manifest enough collecting all they tensions You the soul and body hold it all and still remember But I'm a work in progress testament to all contenders Forgot what it was like to have control over self Forgot what it was like to be the one in charge Forgot in my reflection I could see all my wealth Forgot that with my bare hands I break all these bars Barriers and obstacles They can't cage me They can't chronicle all my experiences and reduce them to appearances when i was truly beaten gave myself clearances to fall down mess up and get myself back up i'm not looking for clovers because i don't believe in luck damn you were bad as i heard them say it clearly why thank you very much i know now i'm not weary of what's next for me because i expect to see growth like i was planted watered fed and bloomed to be the positivity and accountability no one they won't step if I'm the agent of my agency. I think I found my voice again, huh? I think I found my voice again, huh? I'm not sorry, I'm not sorry, you're the end where I begin. Boundaries, I know them well. Take a breath and meditate. Who is she? I know her well. Now I get to open gates. One, two, one, two. I don't need your permission. And if you get uncomfortable, then use your intuition to know that I won't stay where respect is ever missing. And everything I do, that's me making decisions. It's truly underrated the value of self worth. Forgot that I was rich from the moment of my birth. A penny for my thoughts, no, really, you can't afford it. You cannot buy my story, rewrite it, or record it. You cannot buy my story, rewrite it, or record it, huh?